All right. The trust presiding is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the First District Court of Appeals, Mount St. Joseph Road Edition. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, Mount St. Joseph, for hosting us. Thank you to the attorneys who uh, are willing to argue off-site today. We appreciate that as well. So we have, today we've got three cases up for argument. Um, and I'm going to read through them. If the lawyers would please uh, stand and state your appearances and your readiness to proceed. Uh, the first case that we've had is in Ray LP, which is case number C220396. Justin Moss on behalf of the appellant LP, ready to proceed. Paul Adams on behalf of Ohio, ready to proceed. Good morning. Uh, the next case that will be argued after that is case number C220293, in re JC minor child. Josh Thompson on behalf of JC, ready to proceed. Good morning. Good morning. Paul Adams on behalf of the state again, ready to proceed. <laughs> That's right. You're here to stay right there. <laughs> uh, and the final case we have is C220433, speak versus Deloney. Oh, good morning, Your Honor. Ron Springman for the state of Ohio. Uh, we're ready to proceed. Mm -hmm.
from 20 years ago. I'm going to focus on the second assignment of error and send it on the first assignment of error, unless there are any questions from the court about the first assignment of error. The second assignment of error is broken into two parts. The first issue is whether the court erred in denying sealant expungement when LP was rehabilitated and the decision was contrary to the purposes and principles of the juvenile court system. Sealant expungement statutes are remedial in nature. They are supposed to be liberally construed and really supposed to be liberally granted. And this promotes the goals of the juvenile justice system. This is to ensure that children can be rehabilitated and reintegrated back into society and put their youthful offenses in the past. And this is also consistent with the General Assembly's decision to make it easier to seal an expunged juvenile record than it is for adults to seal their records. The, the standard of review is also abuse of discretion, right? We would assert that it is also de novo in this case because the, the issue pertaining to the restitution issue is whether the court, uh, in fact, that the court looked at the non payment of restitution as a factor of whether or not the person has been rehabilitated. And because of that, it's an interpretation of the statute. So, with regard just to the restitution statute, it would be de novo, but with regard to overall whether or not the, the, the um, the case should have been sealed, it would be a, a piece of discretion, correct? So I, I break it into the first issue and the second segment there and the second issue. The second issue I would say would be de novo, the first issue um, would be an abuse of discretion. Okay. okay. In this posture, going to the uh, rehabilitation, um, you know, this individual has a, a pretty lengthy record post being a juvenile. And I think that's something that the court focused on in its analysis. Or could you address how that factors into the equation? Yes, sir. So in the initial matter, this court looked at an NRA AS and NRA RS and looking at adult record sealing, um, somebody showing rehabilitation um, by having an admission of guilt and a promise never to commit some an offense in the future or good nature citizenship. And that's essentially what LP did in this case. So even though there are a number of traffic offenses as, as an adult and two serious offenses, those occurred between 2005 and 2011. Additionally, with the traffic offenses, LP uh, was employed. He is a delivery driver, and he has to then drive for his employment. And so that also shows rehabilitation in the fact that there are these other traffic offenses, but now he has moved. Were, were there not um, additional offenses in 2016 and 2018, including uh, carrying concealed weapon, uh, trafficking and drugs, and other drug related charges? So there is between 2005 and 2011 was a carry concealed weapon and a trafficking in marijuana. There was one um, misdemeanor of possession of marijuana in 2017 with a conviction in 2018. So he had gone four years without committing any kind of criminal offense. And then there were some other um, uh, possession of marijuana charges um, prior to 2017. So wait, there wasn't a carrying concealed weapon in 2016. And then there were there, there were trafficking and drugs in 2016. Is, is that incorrect? That is incorrect. Those were between um, 2005 and 2011. Okay, so after 2011, you're saying that he had no additional felonies? Correct. Okay. Yes, there, there were some possession of marijuana charges, including the last one that was stemmed from the charge in 2017. Now, LP, at the time he filed these applications for sealing expungement, he was 41 years old. He received his GED, and as I already indicated, he was employed. Was, yeah. there, any, was there anything in the record to show? Because a lot of his convictions as an adult involved drug use. Was there anything in the record showing that he had undergone treatment or that he was sober? Not specifically about that. In, in regard to the carrying field weapon and the trafficking and marijuana charge, he did explain to the court that he was a changed person and was not the person that he was all of those years ago. And so that, that was the only information specific about that. And when we're looking at whether a person is rehabilitated, the General Assembly used the word satisfactory. They didn't use word complete, they didn't use total, they used satisfactory, which essentially we're looking at good enough. And that's what LP showed with being employed, with having his GED, and with going at least four years without committing another criminal offense. He's moved forward in his life, and this event he also indicated was holding him back from getting other employment. 
in looking at the specific juvenile offenses, most of these 19 offenses were for low-level offenses. Only two of the 19 were for felony offenses. And none of those again were traffic, and now he's moved past that and is, is driving for his employment. All of these show satisfactory rehabilitation. As to the second issue in the second time of error, the question is whether or not the court can consider this non payment of restitution prior to a person turning 21 that relates to whether the person is rehabilitated. First, this issue is whether a court even has jurisdiction to receive um, this outstanding restitution. But what, and, what does that really matter? I mean, it, it, clearly he didn't pay the restitution at the time. Isn't that a, I mean, it, it can't be the sole reason for denying the ceiling, but isn't that a reason that the, or something that the court can look at to determine uh, whether or not ceiling is appropriate? We would argue that it's not. So in LC case, he's 41 years old. Whether he was able to pay restitution and did pay restitution prior to his 21st birthday shouldn't be part of the information now when he's 41 years old, whether he is presently rehabilitated. And this plus, in several of the juvenile uh, uh, determinations, you were that he was not represented by counsel. Is there a significance to that and how you think it should impact the court's calculus? I think that's one of the determinations here. Um, and looking at the big picture of what these charges are, um, the General Assembly directed the court as one of the factors to look at the nature of the charge. But within that, what happened with that with that charge? And one of those so there was two charges um, that had orders of restitution, although the magistrate only took issue with one of those charges that had a restitution order. Um, but on one of the two restitution charges, he was not represented by counsel as one and wasn't on these other charges. So he didn't have that benefit of having an attorney represent him to give him legal advice to determine how to proceed with the case. He admitted to those without an attorney present. Does the magistrate explain why she only took issue with one restitution? She did not. Well, I mean, looking at the magistrate's decision, it looked like she focused more on the adult record than on the restitution. Because I, I believe it said, um, even if I accept LP's argument as to restitution, I think based on his adult record to me, uh, with the weapons charges and the trafficking charges, it doesn't meet the standard of satisfactory rehabilitation. So it sounds, I mean, it seemed to me that that really wasn't the focus. So this was something that we were, you know, having, um, on a number of different cases, and that was part of the in their analysis, the court magistrate's analysis uh, in denying this was restitution, but she didn't primarily look at um, the adult cases, which again, you know, he's gone 40 years without committing a new offense. So even if we agreed with you that it was improper to take into account the restitution piece of it, didn't, I mean, the thrust of the reason why this was denied was because of the record. So how would that, I mean, how would that be abuse of discretion necessarily? And it seems like harmless considering the rest of the reasons why this was denied. And so the magistrate looked at that and the judge's decision also again looked at um, this consideration of restitution. So it's part of, of the overall consideration and the court was looking at essentially as uh, like it was the sixth factor that the court can look at as to whether or not a person is rehabilitated, whether a person has been rehabilitated. But just so that I understand as far as his record, because I thought the record was a little bit difficult to, to understand as far as what his criminal record was and how old his cases were. So the last case that he had was 2018. Is that correct? The conviction was in 2018. It started in 2017. Okay, so the charges were in 2017 and the yes. conviction was, and that was a drug possession. Which Correct. was a, a misdemeanor. Correct. Okay. And then the last felony that he had was in 2011, is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And so with this restitution, because that was part of this analysis and looking at this overall big picture, the court also, in doing this, looked at the fact that a court only considered the problem of restitution on one case, but then they denied ceiling expungement on all of these cases. So even if the court had jurisdiction to collect the restitution and that was a proper consideration, it certainly should not have been a factor in any of the other 18 cases because either there wasn't restitution on these cases or the court didn't consider that restitution to be a problem. But overall, 
even if you take out this restitution piece, LP meant the satisfactory rehabilitation. You know, these felony charges, it was over 10 years from that felony charge, and he was employed, he's working, he's a driver, he's trying to move forward with his career, and that's the whole point of stealing in front of the statute. I will reserve the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you. You'll have four. Uh, actually, five minutes. Good morning. May it please the court. It's Moss. I'll take care of the community. Um, certainly, uh, the state, the, the crux of our argument is based on the abuse of discretion uh, standard. And I think for reasons that the court has already uh, pointed out here, there was not um, an abuse of discretion in this case. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that the sealing of a, the record is by legislative grace and the statutory um, provision um, that allows a, a court to consider uh, sealing uh, juvenile uh, adjudications asks that the court consider age, the nature of the case, um, the continuation or cessation of criminal behavior, um, employment and, ed and education are some of those factors too, and, and kudos uh, to LP for um, the employment and education aspects of that, but that, that does not um, take away the, the weight um, that could be provided um, for the other and factors. Do you agree with uh, Ms. Moss that, that he did not have any felony convictions after 2011? Um, I did not. Um, I'm pulling in on this case, so I did not author um, the, the brief. And I was, when that question came up, I was looking through that, um, and I don't have the actual dates here. Um, but regardless, I think when you look at what the um, juvenile court judge um, considered here for evidence of rehabilitated to a satisfactory degree, I don't think that necessarily requires a felony. Um, as an adult, the fact that he had, um, he continued on um, with. Um, and, and there's an emphasis on the number of traffic convictions. Um, like, is that is that probative here? I don't think if there was an emphasis necessarily. Um, it's just um, it, it is relevant, um, certainly, that he has a tendency uh, to not follow the law whether that's a traffic law or, um, and, and the fact that when we look, just going back to this juvenile um, record, the, the court um, indicated the sheer volume. Um, and I, I know that there were 19 case numbers involved here, but I think I saw, I believe that we're talking about 27 separate juvenile adjudications. Well, a good number of those were traffic violations. Um, and, and I think that, well, for the juvenile ones, I believe, I, I don't have the, the traffic ones that I have ranging from aggravated burglary um, to resisting possession, and obviously we have the unruly um, one as well. But, I'm, you know, 27, that takes some work, you know, <laughs> and then once you reach adulthood, it's not that, you know, he uh, turned over his leaf then, he, you know, uh, continued on that path. <clears throat> so I, I think that when we look at just overall what a juvenile court is um, provided for in the statute and, and the way that, that went on with all those factors here, I don't think that it can be um, determined that there was an abuse of discretion. Uh, and just to touch on the restitution order, because I don't think it matters. Um, it, I think that it just it speaks volumes for the fact that he couldn't even complete a juvenile disposition that was imposed on him. Well, okay, let's let's back up for a second. So that's a static fact. That was when he was 21 years old. That was the last opportunity for him to pay that restitution, correct? When he was 21? I believe so. Yeah, I don't okay. know. Okay, so he's 41 now. So how are we supposed to look at that? I mean, it's, it's not like he could pay it now. So, I mean, if he has in the past 20 years um, had the ability to pay it, but couldn't pay it, I, I, I guess I, I'm not really understanding how a 20-year-old failure to pay restitution 
should weigh into what is happening now and who, who this person is now. And, and I think the guidance that we get with regard to that is comes from this court's decision in, in Ushery um, with regard to restitution. And the court actually did cite to that this court's decision um, in her um, decision denying um, this. So and I and it, it goes under that catch-all provision of other relevant um, information. The fact whether he could go on to pay it. Maybe, you know, maybe at 22, he hits the lottery and maybe he, he tried to pay it, but he couldn't because it's just the, the fact that it was part of what he was supposed to do at the time um, that wasn't carried through, um, much like any condition of probation um, that, that someone would be placed on. I think that that's the relevance that, and, and not that the court put any significant weight in that factor and with all the other factors, it really is, is the least uh, problematic that if, if if LP were successful and had his juvenile record sealed, that would not impact the adult record, would it? I, I that I don't know. He that was, certainly he would have to go back before all of those other individual courts um, with those adult convictions. So. Right, and I guess I'm just trying to understand. The state's interest here in preserving, and, and yes, there's a couple of serious offenses on the juvenile side, but most are pretty minor. Um, and I'm just trying to understand the state's interest in not having that sealed when he's already got adult convictions so that anyone who needed to search would, would be able to find those. Well, and, and again, this is it's discretionary, um, you know, with the court. So all that um, can be done is that the information is is presented to the court and the court weigh that information. Um, and I just, I think, well, given our current audience, um, that a, a person's background and what you do as a young person has an impact in your future. Um, and so for whatever that's worth, um, you know, it, it, it matters. So um, if that's, you know, the court's mindset, and I can't say that it necessarily was, but I think that's still um, just a point to be met, made that the legislature put forth um, these um, factors to be considered um, for a juvenile court when they're considering this. And um, I don't think that the court at least took their discretion in this case. Thank you. So we have five minutes. Yes, sir. Um, just for clarification, there are 19 uh, case numbers in this case. LP was only appealing 19 of those charges that were the actual adjudications, not all 27 of the charges that were initially before the court. Uh, additionally, uh, there's a difference between the adult ceiling and the juvenile ceiling, where the adult has to weigh you know, the, the state's interest versus the, the individual's interest in whether their records should be sealed. Whereas for juveniles, again, just looking at this matter of whether the person has met the satisfactory rehabilitation standard. So how is it so outrageous for a court? I mean, we're talking, I know you're saying that the restitution is de novo, but we really were talking about an abuse of discretion standard here. And the, the court has to make some sort of arbitrary or unconscionable or, you know, crazy decision. How is that for a judge to look at somebody who had a significant amount of juvenile offenses, goes into adult life and continues not just, I mean, these aren't mis just misdemeanors. I mean, we're talking about drug trafficking. We're talking about carrying concealed weapon uh, charges. And to, how, how can we look at that and say, oh, well, this is crazy that the court doesn't think he's rehabilitated, especially when he still was committing crimes up to five years before he filed for this. I think sometimes it takes an individual some period of time to get their life together. And while you know, he acknowledges that he did have you know, criminal charges as an adult, um, he is now a changed person. He's not that person he was when he was committing those crimes. And that's evidenced by the fact that he's now steadily employed, trying to further his career. And so when you again look at the satisfactory rehabilitation, him going those number of years, it's not as if the year before he filed the applications, that he had, you know, felony offenses or you know misdemeanor offenses for that matter. He, you know, actively chose then to go a number of years and has made that change in his life. He's not picking up those new charges. 
So even though he had these in the past, I think we have to look at presently where he is in his life and what is going on with that employed and going a number of years. And again, he's driving for his employment. So the court looking at all of these traffic offenses, clearly that is not him anymore. Um, and the court in, in, in a three or sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that uh, case name, uh, they didn't focus on whether or not that adult court uh, had jurisdiction to collect those court costs. So in that case, it was a factor of the court that they could look at um, in determining whether or not an adult was rehabilitated. Um, it wasn't an automatic denial of whether a court cost was paid, but again, there was not a determination about uh, whether they had jurisdiction here. We have this issue of the juveniles over the age of 21, and the court doesn't have jurisdiction to collect the restitution. We would ask that and, and assert that the adult record for LP should stand for itself. Let these juvenile cases be what they are. Um, again, we assert that he has shown satisfactory rehabilitation. And we would ask that this court reverse the juvenile court's decision and grant sealing expenses of the juvenile records. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The case is now submitted and we will issue a timely decision. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next case is in the JC. Morning, Would you like to reserve some time for rebuttal? Yes, two minutes. Now that you're ready. May it please the court, counsel. The question before the court today is whether the juvenile court has used its discretion in classifying JC as a tier two juvenile sex offender. Now we know that the juvenile court's purpose is rehabilitative and not punitive. We know that as it relates to this appeal, JC was 14 when he was adjudicated a break. We learned that JC was a victim himself. He was victimized by his uncle, a babysitter, and a female cousin. We learned from Dr. Taylor that JC, at the time of disposition, was at a low to moderate risk to reoffend sexually within seven years. And we learned that children who offend but do not have any paraphilia and who attend treatment have around a 3% recidivism rate. We learned that prior to disposition, JC was very successful with treatment and found a better living situation. So when we consider whether the juvenile court has used its discretion, one cannot help but ask, when it comes to those adjudicated of rape and not registering as sex offenders, if not JC, then who? Well, can, the, the juvenile court applied the correct legal standard, right? Yes. And so the court made findings consistent with what the statute requires, but then it's kind of a balancing inquiry for the court. So I think those are very difficult cases for us, and just like the last case in terms of evaluating the abuse of discretion. So can you focus on what you think is the most uh, salient points to show abuse of discretion? Yes, um, I think I'll start with the court's findings. Um, the court found that the um, juvenile has only shown minimal remorse when prompted. However, um, he acknowledged the wrongfulness of his actions in letters read to the court and Dr. Gies Gang's evaluation and in Dr. Taylor's evaluation. Uh, Ms. Fisher, who also evaluated JC, uh, noted his remorse and his growth to the point of being able to accept 100% of responsibility for his actions. That was all before the juvenile court. Well, so where did the, the finding minimal re uh, remorse come from then? Are you saying the court just made that out of thin air or did it come from one of the expert reports? Um, it would have most likely come from Dr. Uh, Lies Gang, um, who did not, was in the very beginning and who 
was determining whether JC should receive inpatient treatment, not whether he should register. So the minimal rewards uh, finding that is included in the juvenile court's order came from a psychologist who had evaluated him before treatment. Correct. Okay. And then our, your argument is that the other psychologist who testified, who went, you know, had seen him through treatment and evaluated him after treatment, said that he had remorse. Yes. Okay. Just as a matter of timing, um, the first one, Dr. Lee saying, is that it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so her evaluation and her report, that was in April 2021. And as I understand it, JC had just started treatment at that point? I believe he was getting outpatient treatment, um, but it was determining whether he needed inpatient, inpatient treatment. So that was the purpose of her report. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Taylor was only a month later, correct? Uh, that sounds right. Okay. And then um, the other two people who testified, uh, their evaluation of him took place uh, because of what they saw during treatment and the changes that he has made. Yes, that's my understanding. And that was, and those evaluations and that testimony was months later, correct? Yes. Or maybe even a year later? It was a long process. Okay. Uh, there was trouble getting treatment. It took a while. Okay. And, and just so that I'm clear, the only expert who specifically was evaluating whether JC was appropriate for the registry list was Dr. Taylor? Yes. Okay, thank you. And that was a defense expert? It, it was, but I don't recall if it had to be um, requested through the court as a second evaluation scenario. I, I don't recall. But my main point is the remorse finding is not supported by the record at the uh, registration hearing. Um, the court also found uh, essentially that the question of um, the Caldwell study and the uh, standards required regarding juveniles and their likelihood of recidivism is, is an issue for the legislature and not um, She specifically found, the court found that the expert medical testimony presented was indicative of a public safety threat. I think disregarding the science in these studies and the findings of essentially everyone but Dr. Liesgang, who still only found a moderate threat, um, is not again supported by the record. There. There's just nothing happened after, uh, no trouble during that whole. A long, lengthy period before the uh, disposition, or not disposition, but the registration hearing, and um, nobody really found that there was a lot of evidence he would ever commit another offense. Well, I'm trying to understand your argument about the, the studies, because if, uh, if I recall, the court said, look, you know, we might have problems with these sex offender registries, Maybe if people don't believe that they work, but that's an issue for the legislature. Yeah. That's not an issue for the court to decide. Right. Okay. So how as you were saying that was a, that was an abuse of discretion to disregard these studies? My point is that the evidence presented to the court is that he is not a public threat, and these lengthy studies of thousands of juveniles are just additional evidence that should be considered. But that's in general. I mean, I thought that the court actually concentrated on him specifically, whether he was a public threat, and she looked at a lot of different well, I, I'm aspects not, of the crime. I'm not positing that it's uh, dispositive, but I think it is something that one should consider uh, when using the discretion on what, what um, tier registration, if any, to impose. And I still my position, our position is that there was no evidence other than the offense itself, that certainly none that he presented a continuing threat. As nothing happened, none of the evidence showed that uh, there was any real likelihood of recidivism. He didn't have any paraphilia. 
which was the number one factor in whether you might reoffend based on all the, all the studies and the expert testimony of Dr. Taylor. But also, um, well, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, well, there, there were three different offenses, right? So, how, do, how does that factor into the analysis? I argue that the only one that matters today is the one he's registering for because he was not eligible for registration on the other one. And the court, you're saying the court can't even consider the fact that there were other uh, there were other victims. I would say that the actions of a 13 year old have been found to not be relevant to their continuing uh, risk of harm to the community. So that you're saying that would be an abuse of discretion yeah. for the court to even consider. Yes, it would. His actions as a and, and is that because? Uh, a, a juvenile has to be 14 before they are eligible for the list? Yes. Okay, yes. so anything under 13, the court shouldn't even consider? Yes. And I did want to ask you about the recidivism because I thought Dr. Taylor's uh, uh, the scoring showed low to moderate risk. For sex offenses and low for any um, delinquency in the future for years. Yeah, but this is a sex offender registration. So we're yes. looking at his risk for future sex offenses. Well, the question is the public safety threat. So I do think his risk of any um, future delinquency is still relevant. Okay. I thought you looked at the risk of future sex offenses as under the public safety examination. Is that not the case? Uh, the finding the court made was that it was present, presented indicative of a public safety threat. So that's the finding that I'm challenging. Okay. Um, so the offender's prior criminal or delinquency record regarding all offenses, including but not limited to all sexually oriented offenses, or uh, child victim offenses, uh, it relied on the number of charges. Um, the J, uh, JC didn't have any delinquency for this, no record whatsoever. So I, I challenged that, uh, the relevance of that finding. Um, the number of offense he pled to three and two, I argue, are not relevant to this particular tier registration. Um, Again, um, the offense in question was one victim. It points out three victims. That's the same problem. Uh, point two, not being relevant to this issue. The one that he's being made to register, re register for the one that passed that magical 14 year old. Do you have any uh, case law on that, that, that? I don't. Okay. No. And is there any case law contrary to that? I don't know. Um, I don't know, uh, let's see, there was any mental illness or mental disability of the offender, no paraphilia, just major depressive disorder, um, an unspecified trauma disorder. I, I, I question the relevance of that. Um, And lastly, um, they said that the, uh, the, the court found that the mental injury suffered by the victim was exacerbated by the age of the victim. Um, I, I, the length of the amount of time that they had to cope with traumatic events, I, I find that to be a difficult argument. I, I don't know. There was no evidence that the age of the victim somehow made what happened to be different than anybody else who was victimized, I guess. The child was eight. Yes. Okay. Which, Wasn't there evidence that the child was in um, therapy? Not that I recall, but if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I could be wrong. Okay. I don't know. I thought I read that somewhere. I thought I read that somewhere. Then, um, I'll take that I'm wrong on that, but I, my point is exacerbated. It's 
I, I don't know how you can gauge the level of victimization is what I'm saying. I you can't know. presume that an eight-year-old who is raped and is in therapy would... I assume it's terrible. Yeah. I don't know how it's exacerbated. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, and my ultimate feeling here is that given the number of factors that JC um, had in terms of mitigation and the, the success of the treatment, his, um, his uh, amenability to treatment, the um, progress in accepting what he had done, the um, unlikelihood of recidivism, if that's not at least here, I, I, our position is he should be, should never have been made to register. If that's not tier one, I don't know how much better he could have done. And tier two, just our position is that's an abuse of discretion. There doesn't seem to be any, any discretion there. I mean, a rape registration can't be mandatory. I, I, if it's mandatory, there's no discretion. And that's sort of the finding I feel like the court ultimately made here is that um, if JC is a tier two, then nobody could possibly be better. I, I do all right here. Okay. okay. Well, uh, we ask that the court uh, reverse and uh, reserve. Morning, may it please support Mr. Thompson. The um, first, I'd like to, um, and, and I did not emphasize this in my brief, but just to put this case in perspective of procedure, this is the initial classification um, hearing that took place. And I, I can't say that I have ever, in my years of reviewing the, this, um, seen a more complete and thorough hearing with all the experts, um, the reports, all the information that was available uh, to the juvenile court. At remind me of the procedure, like at the end of the juvenile, when he reaches 21, then they do the final hearing. Is that how it works? Correct. The completion of this position hearing under a different um, statutory section um, will occur. At the completion of his uh, his um specific so this is then a determination of whether or not he's going to be continuing to register as a sex offender into adult. Right, that that, that will right. take place. What we're dealing with right now is initial classification, so that's during his treatment um, that that's that's ongoing. And I think that um, Dr. Lee's game. Can you um, back up one second, please? Yes. So this initial classification, how much will that weigh on a final classification? I don't think that there's really any particular level of weight that we're going to go into it. It's, it's completely discretionary with the court. Because of his age, um, he can be downgraded to level one um, at the completion of this position, or it can be removed altogether. Um, it can't go up, but it can only go down at that next space. But I think um, when we look at the purposes um, behind these um, reports um, that we have from the, the psychologists, and again, those the psychologists, um, this is a legal determination that's being made by the juvenile court. The psychologists are just there as, as tools to gather information. They don't make the ultimate um, determination um, with regard to whether or not the legality of, or the appropriate, appropriateness for um, the tier level um, it, that, that's the court's decision to make, not the, the psychologists. They're involved in treatment. Um, Can I ask you just on the on the Lee's gang report? This is I'm a little hung up because they and maybe you disagree, but it was the court's finding of lack of remorse based on the Lee's gang report. I, I believe that, yes, she specifically did make um, that determination, but I think if you look on, and, and Dr. Taylor was a defense expert, that is, um, he was appointed by um, the court for, um, at their request, um, him specifically. But I, I, even Dr. Taylor's report talks uh, about um, his grooming behavior and, and his, his using his own victimization um, as an excuse. 
um, for his perpetrating on, on um, his young family members. This is so, not an excuse, though. I mean, he he was victimized sexually as a child. He, he was, but I think that um, the way the the experts um, garnered that information from him, that when it was convenient for him, he would bring that information up. And and actually even indicating that um, that these youngsters consented um, to his behavior. But didn't that change as he continued through treatment? Correct. And again, that's why this is important to, to note that we're at the initial phase here. Um, and and that there were some challenges um, with this. And, and granted, um, they, the, the trial court was trying to consider the most appropriate treatment. Um, place for him. This is in the height of COVID, trying to get him his treatment. In fact, one of the experts who testified, she was only treating him remotely. She had never even seen him in person. And I think that was a significant factor of how this, you know, and, and the, and the uh, trial court took all of that into consideration, the challenges um, of you know, manipulating all of this um, through those. Um, so, so his treatment, you know, they're doing the best they can, obviously, at that particular moment in time. But this isn't the, the end all be all. Um, again, they'll have another opportunity to, to take a look at this at that completion of the disposition phase. Um, but for um, the initial classification, there's multiple sets of factors. The trial court um, issued a seven page decision painstakingly thoroughly going through all of those relevant factors. Um, so I, I think we're hard pressed and, and even though the theme of um, me here today is abuse of discretion, I have not yet said what abuse of discretion is and that's arbitrary, unreasonable, and unconscionable. Certainly this case um, speaks volumes of how this was not an abuse of discretion and that the trial court painstakingly went through all of those multiple sets of factors uh, pinpointing which ones um, were appropriate in, in JC's case. Can you address the argument um, that it was an abuse of discretion to even consider his crimes as a 13 year old? Absolutely not. Um, I don't believe that um, there is any one of those factors or any case law um, that I know of that would prohibit the trial court from looking at um, his history and, and all the laws. Um, and in fact, I think um, the, the fact that what, what we have here are multiple counts of rape, 17 counts of rape. He was allowed to plead out to three counts of rape involving um, one of the eight old cousins. How many victims are there in total? Pardon me. Do you know how many victims were there? Three victims, three victims. two eight-year-olds, one six-year-old. And this, this occurred over the course of like a year or something? Over the course of a year, yes. And I think that all those factors um, were completely relevant um, for the, the um, consideration, both for you know what was um, the appropriate treatment, trying to get him into residential treatment, obviously was one of the things that his experts were weighing in on as well. Um, and again, with the the environmental aspects going on at the time to the COVID. Um, so um, unless the court has any other further questions, I think that um, there has been no abuse of discretion. Can, can I go back to one thing? Um, so in in the trial court's decision, um, the, the court relied a lot on Dr. And I've seen it put as Dr. Lee's leg and Lee's gang. I'm not sure which one it is. Lee's gang. Yes. Dr. Lee's gang's opinion. Her opinion, though, went to the appropriateness of treatment and what type of treatment, correct? I believe that was the, when the, the SOGA is the acronym, and I, I apologize if you do not know what that acronym stands for, but yes, that's generally the report that the juvenile court gets um, for consideration of treatment. Again, we're at the initial phase, so that's completely appropriate for the trial court to be looking at both of those. But she did not, there was nothing in her report, and she was not hired to give any opinion or any discussion whatsoever about the appropriateness for him being on the juvenile, on, on the registry. Correct. That was not something that she was specifically looking at, but I believe if we look at all of those multiple sets of factors um, that are provided by the legislature, that her report was useful and that information was um, provided in the report. And again, that's the, the, the ex 
experts are just assisting the court in making that. It's a legal determination that the court um, is um, charged with um, deciding on the registration, the, the applicability of registration, looking at those statutory considerations. When a psychologist is looking at an individual, that's not a legal determination. They're just you know, weighing in um, you know, the, the various factors. And I think the fact that um, his own expert had a had a couple of concerns as well um, way heavily um, in favor of um, the registration level that he was placed at. I don't think it would be more concerning if he didn't have a concern. If he was, if he had zero concerns, I mean, then wouldn't that kind of go to credibility? Well, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, if, but I think that the, the fact that um, if this particular expert, I mean, like, this isn't in the record, but doesn't like registration. <laughs> and I think that, you know, certainly the trial court, you know, is, is probably faced with some experts, you know, experts during the business of treating the individual, right? They don't want to say, well, no, this treatment doesn't work. And so, you know, it's a public, public safety thing. So I, it, those expert opinion, you know, and, and that's the, tr the trial court has to weigh those. It's just one factor. Um, that, the, that the court considers. Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, just briefly, um, this was kind of unusual in the amount of time it took to get to the actual registration hearing, the initial classification, and this. This is obviously something we were able to appeal as a final order. So I, I don't see any relevance to the fact that he might come off later. And the irony here is we had so much time, we proved how successful he could be with treatment. And um, the other thing I'd like to address is that if the court would like additional briefing on the issue of considering um, the GDKRD prior to 14 offenses and the Sex offender registration, I'd be happy to address that uh, for this evening. And how old is Juvenile now? 17 or 18 in that range. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The case is submitted and we will issue a timely decision. Great. The final case today is State of Ohio versus Dylan. Whenever you're ready. Mr. Springer, would you like to reserve some time? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we'll reserve three minutes. Good morning, Your Honors, uh, Defense Counsel, and the Mount St. Joe community. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, if it's okay, I was just going to explain the state of Ohio, the prosecution rarely has an opportunity to appeal or very limited based on the double jeopardy clause. So this is what we call an interlocutory appeal. The court granted us leave to appeal this case. It is a death penalty case. And as some may know under Atkins versus Virginia, a person who uh, suffers from an intellectual disability uh, cannot be executed. That's a violation of the school and unusual punishment provision in the constitution. And we had a, hearing was called an Atkins hearing, and the trial court determined that uh, Mr. Delaney does suffer from intellectual disability, so the state brings his appeal. And the issue that we have before the court is that uh, Mr. Delaney refused continuously from the outset to cooperate. Mr. Thomas, what, what is the standard of review here? Uh, it would have been an abuse of discretion. And I would argue that this has to come down to a question of law. Well, and so that's where I got confused because your assignment of error is that the judge, the trial court committed an error of law. But what is the error of law that the trial court committed? I would like to see a rule of law that would state that anytime 
a person, in this case, the defendant, fails to cooperate with experts. They don't care for the board. You can't make a right, but that's I mean, the, there's no authority for that, and that's not what the trial court held. He didn't hold to the contrary to that. He was applying the Supreme Court's test, right? And I mean, I think my confusion about your position is in the entire argument of your brief, you don't discuss the trial court's decision. So I don't know really what we're supposed to do with that. The trial court's decision, in our opinion, it went over and we could discuss what Dr. Dreyer said. We could discuss what Dr. Smith said. I don't and can't, sorry, comprehend really a lot of what Dr. Smith said. I know he rendered an opinion based upon reasonable psychological certainty that Mr. Delaney meets the definition of intellectual disability. Dr. Dreyer was unable, because of the non-cooperation of Mr. Delaney, to reach that conclusion. The trial court apparently credited Dr. Smith's testimony. Well, the Supreme Court requires the trial court to make findings, and there's 13 pages of findings here by the trial court, right? But your brief doesn't discuss those findings or tell us why they're wrong. They are wrong because Mr. Delaney did not cooperate in the entire process. That's why they're wrong. That's our position, because what we have now, what's set up to occur is a situation where any defendant who wants to avoid the death penalty simply can refuse to cooperate from the outset. But wait, wait, but in this particular case, so you want us to basically say in an opinion that if a defendant refuses to cooperate with psychological interviews and testing, that they cannot avoid the death penalty. Then the experts should not make a decision that, based upon a reasonable psychological certainty, that the defendant meets the definition of intellectual disability. Well, here, it wasn't just the experts. I mean, the trial court went through painstakingly, went through the factors and looked at the DSM-5. I mean, the trial court was not bound by either of the experts' opinions. The trial court here himself, you know, very, very thoroughly looked at every single factor. Oh, I understand. That's the issue. The issue for the state is that this sets up a blueprint. But I don't understand how that's the case, because what the trial court was relying on and is supposed to rely on, based on the Supreme Court standard, is testing that occurred years earlier that showed the mental disability from an early age and that continued as he went through school. So, like, not everybody's going to have that, right? And so that was a foundational aspect of the trial court's decision. And both experts essentially validated that. And then they kind of differed about, like, what happened afterwards. So I think that the notion of this being a blueprint, I just don't think is accurate on these facts. If I'm facing a death penalty and I decide that I'm simply not going to cooperate from the beginning, I'm not going to listen to my counsel's advice, I am just going to do nothing. And then, in essence, that is a way to sort of gain the system. But that's not what the trial court, I mean, the trial court didn't just, the trial court itself made a lot of findings based on the past. I mean, it's not like everybody here, you know, anybody could do what this defendant did and have the same result. I don't, please explain to me how that works. My, here's my analogy, state versus work, which was relied upon by the trial court in its opinion. And in state versus work, 
the defendant did not cooperate with experts. And the trial court, uh, I think Dr. Nelson testified for the state, and there was a few other experts that testified for the defense. And there were findings made, and those findings were, is that, pardon play words, is that defendant were, in that case, did not meet the standard for intellectual disability. Right, but I think this is where this is what I'm saying. Like, I don't think it's a blanket rule. Like, a defendant cooperates or not, and therefore the trial judge must do this. Rather, it is based on the analysis of the expert testimony, the trial court's analysis and assessment of that testimony, and either crediting or not the experts based on the persuasiveness of their analysis. Like, why why would they not do that in every single case? Well, there's, you know, what, what the difference with were is that that law is set up since they found that he did not meet the criteria for intellectual disability. Uh, he wasn't rewarded for his non cooperation. The state's concern here is that someone can be rewarded for their non cooperation with expert witnesses. And that's what happened here. Nobody disputes that. But I thought and the defense expert and even the trial court found that the refusal to cooperate with his lawyers, with the experts, um, it, it, it could be indicative of an adaptive defect. So mm -hmm. how do you address that? Yeah, I would address that by, uh, that's, uh, I know there was some conflicting evidence, so we have to take it light of the verdict winner. So how I would address that is, again, that is overlooking one of the main concerns. You know, he was smart enough, to, uh, Mr. Deloney, to manipulate this system because he knew the difference between uh, the four standard versus the lot standard. So he knew what he was doing here. And uh, I would argue that you still have the same problem that that isn't always necessarily going to mean uh, that that goes to your intellectual functioning just because you uh, are able to, uh, uh, you're gaming the system. I mean, that's what you do. But I don't think that they said that that in and of itself means, um, no. I, I think what they were looking at is this, or all of his records, his, his records from the youth, the testing, um, testimony from his girlfriend that you know he's never um, he's, he's never lived alone he's never really taken care of himself and in combination with the fact that he's refusing to cooperate I mean it seems to be kind of this there's a lot more than just refusal to cooperate and what you're asking us to do is say if you refuse to cooperate then you can't raise these issues right that's what you want us to say yeah based and also based on upon the particular type of this case, because we do have one expert that could not. Well, but, but see, I think this is the problem. Like, you haven't identified any of case law authority for that. And then when you go to the facts of the case, that's where you haven't addressed the factual findings that we have to defer to. So I think, like, I, I, that's where there's an there's a disconnect between what you're arguing to us and what I see in the brief. Well, we understand what the factual findings are and they are not for us. But there are factual findings of Dr. Smith rendered and rendered an opinion that based upon a reasonable degree of psychological certainty, Mr. Delaney suffers from an intellectual disability. We understand that there's conflicting evidence in the record, and we have to look at that a lot of those favorable to the defense. Where our argument is, and it will continue to be, is I think that there is that blueprint there where someone can simply be obstinate, not cooperate, uh, not uh, uh, abide by the advice of counsel, and simply. Uh, get away with uh, avoiding, um, you know, what is, you know, avoiding possible facing the death sentence. It, 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 it goes to other things too, not just simply uh, act 
Hayden versus Virginia, you know, DNA testing is one thing. If uh, DNA testing is granted and someone takes a swab to the defendant and says, okay, you need to cooperate and obtain and give us a DNA sample, that it doesn't do that, it's over. You know, you need the cooperation of the defendant. Well, that's, a, that, first of all, that's a very different context. Oh, it is, but it's just saying. Is it up to the court to make a, a blanket rule that if a defendant doesn't cooperate, then uh, they are eligible for the death penalty? I and mean, wouldn't that more be a legislative function rather than a court function? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I think it's a, you know, what we have here is a, a factual record where the defendant from day one never cooperated. It puts the state at a strong disadvantage. Uh, how are we supposed to uh, counter uh, any type of evidence if the defendant's not going to cooperate? Uh, what position are we in then uh, when someone refuses to cooperate and to assist? It, you know, if the defendant is seeking to try to, the burden's on the defendant here to establish that he meets the criteria for intellectual disability. And if the defendant is going to refuse to cooperate when the burden's on him to demonstrate this intellectual disability, I uh, find that to be an issue. You are at your time if you'd like to reserve some rebuttal time. Okay, thank you very much. And please support Mr. Springman. Um, the, on the issue of non cooperation, simply isn't valid. If, first of all, the defendant would have to have IQ testing lower than 70, have all the educational records that the judge reviewed in, in all the cases, and then decide not to cooperate. In, in spite of looking at a death penalty. This is the only case I've ever heard of. Normally, a defendant will do everything to cooperate to get off the death penalty. He is not going to, his not cooperating is not going to help most of the time, except in this very rare case. If he doesn't cooperate, great. Then the case will go on whether he cooperates or not. Not right, cooperating is going to stop the prosecution. Right, because you wouldn't be able to have an expert to apply if the defense defendant is not cooperating, or if he did a fine, he would be subject to you know prosecution. Right. And, and, and in this case, the defendant's non-cooperation isn't as valid, or you can't use that as a general rule. If you don't cooperate, then then you're facing death penalty. That's it. You don't have that defense because there was sufficient evidence to allow Judge Esther to make his decision. And you have yeah. you had an expert. One expert said he didn't cooperate, so I can't I can't give an opinion. Right. Your actually, expert that right. actually did change his mind from the first hearing, but and, and, and if he was going to you know decide, well, I'm just anti-death penalty, he would have done it in the first case and said, Yes, I can decide now for a reasonable degree of psychological that he does do that. And he say probably has won a lot of time and effort by putting that in his first opinion. But how did he, why did he change his mind and because say that he got, now he can offer it? Because he got different records, Judge. He had more of the educational records. He had more of the work records. He had, any plus he had, let's see, 15 to 22, seven more years of transcripts, records that could come out, to only dealing with the court to base his decision. And remember, Judge Nestor had 49 separate hearings since took over the case. Each time, the warning came down. It's a death penalty case. The rule of thumb is the defendant always comes down in death penalty. 49 times he could observe Mr. Colony's behavior, see what he was doing, see what he was like. So he's not just basing it on some nebulous person that he knows nothing about and he was for an expert. He's also his own first hand knowledge, questioning Mr. Colony, asking him why he won't cooperate, getting the answers. And then he can also put that into making his decision. The so these key hearings that you're talking about where the judge is addressing him, this is on situations where he is not cooperating and the judge is actually engaging in a talk yeah. with him no, about not, why not. Not all of them, but 
many of them, the same issue would come up. Mr. Deloney, why aren't you cooperating with your attorneys? Why aren't you cooperating with your expert? And he would listen to Mr. Deloney's answers. And he could use that in rendering his opinion. Plus, he had Mr. Deloney's writing. I remember Dr. Smith was asked, well, look at all these pleadings. Look at how smart they are. And Dr. Smith said, well, one, I don't know if you wrote them or not, just copied them from another inmate. And two, if you brought him up here and put him on the stand and asked him, what does that motion mean? I doubt if he'd be able to tell you. He wouldn't understand what they meant. Right, and I just want to go back. He also was not, beyond not cooperating with the expert, he was not cooperating with counsel too, right? So he wouldn't cooperate with anybody, Judge. His family told him from day one, Mr. Inconin, Mr. McKenna, as his attorney, don't cooperate. There's been a wrongful indictment. Don't worry, just go to trial. And this will all come out the case will be dismissed. He's had six defense attorneys, three judges, four, at least four prosecutors, four through that file. And nobody can find anything but a wrongful indictment. It's simply not going to happen. And I'm afraid if we didn't have this accusation came up, that he's going to be awful disappointed on the day of trial when he comes up with what he comes up with. And Judge Nestor goes, no, that, that's not bad. We're going to continue the trial. How long, I mean, so he's been in the Justice Center for how long? Uh, almost 10 years, actually. Nine years, eight months, about 17 days. Longer than anybody I know who's been in the Justice Center, which is another fact. Normally, a defendant that long in the Justice Center would do anything to get out of the Justice Center, would plead to everything, would do it. Mr. Dolan, he doesn't care. He's fine with it. Anybody else would have went insane being in there for that long. I'm almost by the Justice Center, but he doesn't because that's, that's never been a factor. It's never been a factor. And I, I, I thought that by now we would have decided to cooperate just to get moving. And if Atkins hadn't came up, it probably would have been done. But the Atkins issue has put us in this position. Judge Nestor looked at everything, not only the expert reports. And remember, in State First Board, it says the court may use experts and may appoint experts. It doesn't say they have to. Now, I don't know if any judge was ever going to go forward. And because the attorney's going to have experts, for sure, without having experts. But then they have to. It says you may, it says you have to write an opinion, which Judge Nestor did. It doesn't say you have to have experts. But he did have experts. And it's interesting to note that in there, he also referenced previous doctors who couldn't come to a decision on Atkins, Dr. Schmidt got something. We, when we put in the exhibits, and you'll see in the record, every single doctor who issued a report, whether competency or this issue, put in the record. So the judge had all the doctor's opinions. And some of them think, says, I can't come to an opinion on Atkins. Some, all of them said he's competent, doesn't have a mental illness, might have a developmental disability. But the judge had all of those in his reference too. And some of them, even though they couldn't say to a reasonable degree of psychological medical certainty, did reference those reports and did say, this is why I think he probably has developmental disability, IQ is less than 70, and meets the standard of Atkins for And nobody disputed the prior testing. Everybody said the prior testing was reliable. Yes, everybody agreed. Two prior tests. There was actually three, I think. There was, uh, uh, I can tell you right now, the Wensler test, um, when he was 13, with verbal score of 65, performance of 66, full score of 63. Keep any individual achievement test, mild retardation score, and all these are in the record, uh, 179. Violent adaptive behavioral scale, mid-range and minor of mental retardation, uh, exhibit nine again. At age 19, Wessler individual achievement test, second edition. Consistent with one who suffers from an intellectual disability, exhibit nine. He's been special education courses his entire high school career. By the time he's in high school, he's in the special courses. He had an IEP plan. And now, was, that, was that all in front of the court during the first hearing in front of Judge Cooper? No, a lot of it wasn't. A lot of it was, I, anyway, I was there for the first year, but I just want to point to the case. I don't remember. Uh, 
Well, his, his IEP, kind of specifically his IEP. Yeah, IEP had a uh, uh, plan that they gave to him. And it doesn't say whether he had something like that in elementary school, but my guess is he probably did. Um, when he went to Cincinnati State, he said, not so fast. You have to take all these developmental courses before we would make And he never took those courses. He never took them. And with all due respect to Cincinnati State, it's not exactly hard. It, it is not going to be as hard to get in, but he still had to have those courses. They still wanted him to do that. He, those, so all those kids, Edward, he said, those are facts. That is an argument for the attorneys. Those are absolute strong bold facts. All and those. One things. more question about the difference between the first hearing and the second hearing. Um, the, I saw the employment history that he worked just a few months at for two months at Frisch's and then at Long John Silver's. He right. Was, and then was fired because he couldn't keep up. Was that yeah. before the first, in the first hearing? I honestly don't remember. Okay. I, I do not remember. It may have been, it may not have been. I think his work history did come up, but I don't know if it's that kind of detail. And once again, you know, there's a lot of reason to get fired from a job. You don't care, you want to get fired, you don't want to work there. But it is indicative of those two jobs. He didn't last very long. And the doctor tied into, once again, his IQ, his developmental disabilities. He couldn't cut it. And these are rather, I don't want to say menial, but they don't require, you know, a lot of intelligence to do. And a lot of people can do them, but he couldn't. He lived with his girlfriend. She makes all the payments. She has all the purchasing power, has the power of attorney to handle financial affairs. And the biggest thing to me, as long as I've lived here since 2015, is Mr. Deloney's absolute refusal to cooperate with any of his attorneys. And it's not like, well, gee, Mr. Rob, maybe, you know, he just didn't like you. He has not along with Mr. Wendell, Mr. Angona, Mr. McKenna, Mr. Ellsworth, Mr. Washington. He had, didn't get along with Judge Cooper, Judge Martin, now Judge Nestor. He doesn't cooperate with anybody. And if you look through the transcripts of the hearings, you'll see again and again, Judge Cooper, please help. Please help yourself do this. Judge Martin, same thing, cooperate with your attorneys. Judge Nestor, cooperate with your attorneys. Don't do this yourself. Each time you end up, I'm going to cooperate. And then at the end of the day, you just flat out does it. And it's like, so I thought, so the record shows that it's it's his family that's... that's yes. Uh, it, my understanding is that somehow his father, who was controlling everything in the family, told him no cooperate. We have the jail phone calls where his father screams at him, don't cooperate, don't sign anything, don't do anything. They're all corrupt, they're all evil, you know, it's all big plot. The judge, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys are all in on it, it will help them out. So don't sign anything, no cooperate. And, and judge, this is even after his father died. His father died two years ago, but he's still. So your opposing counsel says that that lack of cooperation is actually gaming the system. It's not. It's, it's actually putting a gun to his head and hoping the bullet doesn't go off when he pulls the trigger. That's what it is. It's not gaming the system. Under any other circumstances, his failure to cooperate is doing him. You don't cooperate with your attorneys, you go to trial, you are going to lose 99% of the time. And so this is not getting in the system. This is basically committing judicial suicide. This is legal suicide, what he, what's he doing? But he doesn't understand that. He can't understand it. Dr. Smith said, people like who have these disabilities have a fallback position. And his fallback default position is don't cooperate. If I can't figure out what to do, I'll simply fall back on don't cooperate. So what happens? Whenever an issue comes up, okay, great. I'm going to my fallback position. I'm not going to cooperate. And this has been going on for almost 10 years. He's not being in the system because he's basically, except for this Atkins issue came up, he's basically saying either give me life without parole or give me the death penalty because either of those things are going to happen when he doesn't cooperate. But he doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand that. Nobody can figure out what he thinks is going to happen in the day of trial, except he has this theory that it's all going to go away. It's not going away. The case isn't going away. Um, either the Atkins, you know, go to trial without the death penalty step, 
or the scope will decide to overturn it, and he will work to that point. And then they'll be arguing in habeas corpus for post conviction for years about why everyone was wrong and he shouldn't have gotten it. Then, any questions, Judge? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Spurman, yeah. Two minutes. Okay, thanks. Three minutes. Thanks, Judge. Just a couple of things on uh, my understanding is that they had some additional records that they didn't have the first hearing that consisted of some uh, records from Cincinnati State Technical College and also some records from uh, his uh, schooling in Indianapolis. And uh, Dr. Dreyer uh, did discuss the limitations of that testimony. In fact, uh, her testimony, as the court has read or somebody will read, differs dramatically from Dr. Smith. And one interesting point here, though, is Dr. Smith, he didn't understand the new Ford test. So his opinion is basically similar to the last hearing on page 88 of the record. Uh, he said he looked at Ford and it really uh, doesn't necessarily seem like it's done a change from the professional standpoint. But does it matter whether he understands it? I mean, what matters no, is no. But what I'm getting at is that uh, when you you look at the evidence in this case, the bottom line is, is Mr. Deloney, we can say he's not gaining the system. We can say he's committing illegal suicide by his non cooperation. But it looks to me like he's getting uh, one benefit. And that is he's avoiding a death penalty. And to me, that's you know some element of gamesmanship there. And uh, his non-cooperation has been, whether we like it or not, a benefit to him. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, both for your arguments today. The case is now submitted, and we will finish the time. That concludes court for today. Thank you, everybody.